Welcome back to the Self Made Podcast. And for the first time ever, we have a guest that I'm not like best friends with. <laughs> well, I'm like best. What, what, I didn't, wow. Whoa, whoa. wow. Is that how we're starting off? Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is. Dig it no, all, no, no, no. Someone that I've Should been, I leave? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's bring it back. Let's bring it back. Oh, no, you started. Okay. You started. <laughs> Today, we are very, very excited. We have an incredible guest. Before we Why jump in, I though. Go there. <laughs> I don't Matt, know Matt, he's not excited. He wants one of his friends to come. Before we, we jump are in. Friends. <laughs> to be very, I don't, I don't know what you're doing. Do it. Before we jump in, we are here on Self Made. I'm really glad to be here. I'm here with Matthew Nate Shot Haig. I'm Jackson. But more importantly, we have an incredible guest today who's been really just a, uh, a foundational part of 100 Thieves. Foundational part of 100 Thieves. A co owner and probably the most successful person we've had on Self Made. Un- I don't like to measure like in, in a, a specific metric of success, but you are one of like the biggest names in all of entertainment across the entire world, which I think is unbelievable. Obviously, we have Scooter Braun, co owner. All right, I'm not going to do that. All right, we're going to do the quick intro. So entrepreneur- no, that's the intro. Oh, you know, I'm going to list some of the things he's done for the people. Okay. Entrepreneur. I just want to say I'm really enjoying myself so far. Good. I'm not his friend and you're doing a great job. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Entrepreneur, entertainment mogul, investor, philanthropist. You've done so many different things. Ariana Grande, Justin Bieber, so much talent. Uh, you were 2013, I think, Time Magazine top 100 most influential people in the world. Um, all kinds of philanthropic projects. We'll, we'll talk a little What's that word it. again? Philanthropic? Philanthropic. Philanthropic? I'm sorry. Uh, but most importantly, you are a co-owner of 100 Thieves. Yes, I am. It's the greatest achievement of my life other than my wife and children. <laughs> I appreciate that dearly. Yeah. Um, before we jump in, though, we are going to read a review. Basically, we've been going through, and when people say nice things about us, we juice ourselves up, basically. Our producer picks a, uh, a review. This podcast is available on where all podcasts are found, Google, iTunes, Spotify, The Works. You can also watch this live on YouTube, youtube.com forward slash Nate Shot. If you guys want to see us in video, I think that's the place to be, but I'm not going to make that decision for you. But we have a five-star review from iTunes coming from Jess277. He said, I never listen to podcasts and personally have never really been into them, but I've been following Nate Shot for a while now and watching him grow into such a level-headed, well-spoken, and no business man is amazing. It's also a great podcast to listen to because I am now going into college as a business major, and it's great to listen to entrepreneurs and how they grew their brand. This is exactly why we made the podcast. Alex, thanks for picking that review and really gassing me up. I really need that today. It's been a rough one, especially since the beginning of this podcast did not go too well. Um, but we appreciate all five-star reviews. Let's get into the show. All right, the last- intro, oh, Rocket Mortgage. Damn it, Jackson. We forget. What a great reminder. Rocket Mortgage has been a foundational partner for us here at 100 Thieves. We got the Rocket Mortgage team house, and they have done everything in their power to make us. Oh, we have an ad read this time. We have a Rock and Mortgage ad read. It's great. Usually we do it in the middle of the show. Scooter, we're going to get to you. Just settle on in. Uh, get on your uh, phone I'm or something. I'm still here. Don't worry. Okay, perfect. Well, this Not is how... Not a friend, but you know. Th- it's fine. Well, this is how we keep the lights on, so I th- it, we're going to do it. I want to make. I want to take a moment to give a huge shout out to Rock and Mortgage, the presenting sponsor of the Self Made Podcast. We've worked with them since the beginning of 100 Thieves. As a partner, they understand that a home is so much more than a house, and nothing is more proof than that than, than, the, than the incredible additions this year to our Rock and Mortgage team house for our LC team which is on their way to a playoff spot go, baby we've won don't call five it out of, we've won five out of seven games we're monsters right now Oop, believe it uh their dedication to going that extra mile has not only allowed us to elevate 100 thieves content but also to make the home buying process smoother for their clients rock and mortgage by quicken loans push button get mortgage scooter i want to know everything <laughs> okay because we are friends yes we are just someone that i haven't known for like the last decade of my life i, I get and it that's all the guests that we've had on i, I would like I, to look clarify. the fun part for me is that I know that you've had a lot of people on the show so far, uh, I think two, um, and both of those people are better friends than me, but I am closer to you than you are with Jack, when that's all that matters to me. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't even like Jack. Oh, that's my point. Yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. And he's not even in the house today. Jack actually just left for 10 days. He's going to uh, visit home in New Jersey, and then he's casting the Fortnite World Cup. And so, honestly, the house is much quieter. It's much cleaner. I just feel better. It's great. And now Scooter Ronnie would show up, but... I guess it doesn't really matter. We FaceTime a lot, uh, so it's fine. You introduced Jack to Ariana Grande. Yes, and I did. he leaves the day that you get to the house for the first time ever. That's got to say something. I think you you like me more than you like Jack, too. 
You know, it, it's funny because um, I always, I always knew he had this this strange sense of uh, disloyalty towards me, <laughs> and um, I really thought he was going to be here today, but oh. he chose um, family and friends over me. Hate to see it, and Hate so I, 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 I see his priorities are probably in the right place. Just the worst <laughs> individual. What a guy. So here's what I told Scooter on the phone before he got to the house today. I know that Scooter has probably told his story of his career and the way that he has evolved his brand and all the businesses that he's a part of. But I guess all the interaction that we have, it's directly related to Honor Thieves. Scooter has done everything in his power over the last year to help us be more successful. He has introduced us to so many wonderful relationships that, has, that have helped us just continue to elevate 100 Thieves. Like, one of the best co-owners that you could ever ask for. And uh, the one aspect of all of this in our relationship is that I know your story from a high level, but I really am genuinely so curious to dig into the weeds a little bit. So not to make you do this all over again for probably the millionth time, but I'm going to make you do exactly that. Okay. I want to know where Scooter Braun started as early as you want to begin. And just we're going to ride this, this, this journey and then we'll figure out where it goes from there. Where did Scooter begin his career? I'm going to take you all the way back, even before I was born. No <laughs> lie. No, actually, the only reason I say that is because, like, to understand, uh, it's strange to talk about yourself, but the only way to really understand me is to understand where I come from. And really, like, the foundation my family built for me is how I kind of see the world. So my grandparents, um, my dad's side, were Holocaust survivors. My grandmother was in Auschwitz. Uh, my grandfather was in Dachau. They uh, survived the camps, pretty much lost everyone. Um, and then found each other, started family, had a, a girl and then a boy, my father. Um, then starting their family, trying to re-pick up the pieces after being in these death camps um, with small children. The Hungarian Revolution started and they had to escape literally in a horse and buggy. Uh, they escaped over the border into Austria where they'd claim refugee status. And my dad is a refugee in the United States of America. He came here when he was three years old, grew up in Queens. My grandmother you know, worked in a sweatshop 18 years while he was growing up. My grandfather did odd jobs. My mom sighed. Her dad died when she was 11. And her mom did everything that they could kind of survive with barely high school education. And my parents both really came from nothing um, but love. You know, a very loving family but didn't have resources. And I was first generation to have something. There was no trust fund. There was nothing. But my parents both became professionals. Both met in college um, and provided a nice house for us with food on the table and a really loving household. And I always felt this sense of guilt of like, why me? Why did, you know, there was no, nothing waiting for me to inherit, but it was like, why do I get a life so much better than the generations before? And what's happened to me since, I truly believe that everything that's happened to me is because of not only the sacrifices that all those people made, but somebody upstairs is looking out. And it's not just for me to kind of reap all the benefits because all the sacrifices were from others. So my entire outlook on life is like, if, if somebody's pouring, you know, goodness into my glass, if I don't pour it into someone else's glass, it's going to spill on the table. So my job is to really make sure that I build a story for myself and my family and, and help as many people as possible. And that's really kind of the foundation. Um, and then Scooter Havings, my real name is Scott. And I was uh, really skipping forward first grade, third grade, somewhere in there. You look like a Scott. Thanks, man. I never felt it, but you know, <laughs> uh, I was at a birthday party and the clown magician guy goes, what's your name? And I was like, Scott. And he's like, Scooter. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like that's not my name. <laughs> and my brother, my little brother, Adam, he saw that pain and frustration in being called Scooter. And that was all he needed to see to try and make that my nickname for the rest of my life. Oh, he saw an opening. It yeah. Was and, and it really was in high school and middle school, kind of a thing that was like really close friends knew, but no one else. When I went to my friend Scott in high school. Yeah, I was Scott with like close friends calling me Scooter, like I'd dribble out the ball for a basketball game and my brother, people would be like, ride the scooter to victory. Like, <laughs> you know, something like something messing with me. But I was really Scott. Um, and the first time I ever got called Scooter publicly was my high school graduation. I was class president. I made a speech and uh, my friend Kate, uh, who was vice president, she walked up and introduced me as Scott Scooter Braun. That was the first time publicly. And my buddy made a bet with me that when I went to college, um, I couldn't convince everyone at freshman orientation my name was Scooter. And it was $100. I'm like, that's a lot of money back then. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm going to do that. So I convinced everyone my name was Scooter. One thing led to another. I started selling fake IDs, party promotion, all this other stuff. And Scooter was a better name for marketing. And that's how I became Scooter. Wait, can we back up for two <laughs> seconds? Yeah. So you were the student council president in high school. You played on the basketball team. And were you prom king? 
I was, we had a homecoming court and I was in the court. Yeah. So you're basically like a Disney TV show in high school, <laughs> like, you're like Zach Efron, except for one problem. What? I was four foot 11, my freshman year of high school. Whoa. Same, same. I was 86 pounds. And dude, I was four foot 11. I was the smallest guy in the school. And, um, I, I literally was like friends with all the girls because I wasn't tall enough to date any of them. And I really, it made me appreciate kind of everybody. That's probably how the class president thing. I, I got along with everybody because when you're that small, either you're just like cracking jokes and being the clown in the class, or you're kind of getting along with everyone. And I played basketball, so that was pretty hard. I can um, tell you with confidence that none of those things that you just said was true because my situation was the exact opposite. What I was yours? I did not have any friends. Really? Well, I mean, I had a couple, but... Well, you probably didn't because you start off podcasts by telling people they're not your friends. <laughs> you know, so... Um, oh, you know, he's not my best friend. I'm going to regret that for no, a look, long it, look, time. Look, my thing was team sports kind of introduced me a lot of people, but it was uh, being that small actually kind of instills this sense of like, like you, you don't... You're never going to be the bully. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're always going to be, you know, the person that's kind of seeing everybody from the different point of view because you have to sit back and watch because you're so small. You have to look at life differently. And you hear this thing of Napoleon complex. And I think that might happen if you remain small. Um, but you've grown. I've grown. I grew 12 inches in high school. And how tall are you? 5'11". <sighs> I'm not. I'm not. I'm like 5'10". It's 5'9 okay. with shoes off. Okay. Well, you know what? At the end of the day, you're not 4'11". And even if you were, I would still love you and you'd love me and we'd be friends. I think I'm not really sure how this is going, uh, but it, in all honesty, it was it, high school was an interesting experience because you every single year was a different thing, and I, I was really lucky to like have great childhood friends. Absolutely. So you get to college. You said you started promoting parties. You started selling fake IDs. Fake IDs first because I had to make some money, and then when I realized I didn't want to do that and get caught, I started promoting parties because I was I wasn't going to ca get caught selling fake IDs. I was going to say Emory in Atlanta. I went down to Emory in Atlanta. And where I'm, you were from originally? Uh, originally from Connecticut. Nice. So uh, my family, my dad's from Queens. My mom's from upstate New York. We lived in New York City um, while my parents were kind of figuring out. When I was born, they didn't even live together. They couldn't afford to live together because um, they were both. My mom, my dad was in residency. My mom was still in school. Wow. And, um, and then when I was about six years old, seven years old, we moved out to Connecticut. Did you always have the expectation? I, I'm, I'm always curious to ask people that are successful. Did you always have the expectation in your head in high school that college was absolutely happening? Like that was the clear next no, step? No, I mean, all I had the expectation is that I wanted to leave my town. Like I, I, like I had a really good high school experience, but I just saw the world as a much bigger place and I would watch TV and see all this different stuff. And I'd never even been to Los Angeles till I was probably 20 years old. I'd never been to Miami till I was 19 years old. Like I'd been different places, but the places where entertainment was like New York City was about it for me because I li lived 45 minutes from New York City. And I just thought there was this amazing opportunity out there and I wanted to get out there. And I remember vividly telling my dad I didn't want to go to college and him literally chasing me around the house to whoop my ass because he was like, you're going to school. And when I got down there, slowly my plans changed and, you know, I started my business and uh, at the time... If I could do it all over again, I wish I would have finished. Your dad probably felt and put that much pressure on you because like generational responsibility. You know, you talk about how your family sacrificed yeah. so much. You probably, we didn't do all of this for you to like quit school, like take the right path. My mom said it best. When my, when my parents found out my sophomore year that I had officially left school, my mom was devastated. It was a lot of tears on both sides when I finally admitted it to her. And she just said, you know, all of this, you know, you're the oldest of five kids, like you're not setting the right example. And you have to remember, my parents really came from nothing. And, b and both of them, um, getting a college education was how you made a better life for yourself. And, you know, I, I really do wish that if I could do it all over again, I would have finished because I feel like I missed out on certain things in certain years of my life that really could have been amazing. Um, but I don't, I have no regrets. I love my life at 38. I love what's happened. Um, but I also want to set the right example for my kids because when they get older, I want them to go to school. Oh, of course. It's interesting now, like dropping out of college, at least with tech startups and everything is a little more sexy. Even 20 years ago, I imagine it was not 
a thing that was encouraged. Oh, he's starting his own business. Okay, he's a dropout and has nothing going for him. I mean, but there's a really great Medium article that came out that said the average tech entrepreneur doesn't even find the thing that makes him successful until they're 39. And the average entrepreneur, I'm sorry, the average entrepreneur finds it at 39. The average tech entrepreneur doesn't find it until 47. Wow. So you have these like examples of people like myself and other, you know, people have done it much bigger than me who were really, really early and dropped out of school and they found it. But those are really small and anomaly. Uh, and anomalies anomalies i could couldn't get the word out it's like you with philanthropist <laughs> um, and uh and, but at the same time i just feel like when you're young and you don't have kids and you can go two or three days without eating and sacrificing that's when you should go after your dreams you know and and that's when you pursue it with reckless abandon because the worst case that happens is you fail and you wake up the next morning you get after it again when you have children like i now have three children things change you have to live for their dreams for their safety for their well-being and, you know, so I just, I think it sucks when people are, we're trying to protect our children. So we're constantly trying to give them the easiest path, but nothing great ever became easy. And I think young people should go after it. I agree with all those things. Honestly, it's, it's, it, it uh, that was probably the one thing that I was most excited to just sit here and talk with you because with all the experiences that you have, you have just so much deep knowledge and how to approach life philosophically and from like a, a physical standpoint. Um, and I, and I, just to dive a little bit deeper into when you start talking about promoting parties, um, what, what is the, what was the mindset behind that? Cause like, what is the business behind party promotion? Like you always hear about promoters in LA and I'm sure what you were different in at what you were doing was very different in Atlanta, but that was the beginning of your business because obviously like what I want to get to is how did you start discovering talent and think to myself, okay, I see something here and there's an opportunity. How do I take this to the next level? So you know, I was in Atlanta. I'm at a school where there is a group of kids who have access and trust funds and everything, credit cards, and they're going out and they're partying and popping bottles and doing all that. And I don't have any of that cash, but I don't like being broke. So uh, I walked by this nightclub one night and this, you know, on the way to another one that everyone was going to. And I said, hey, if I get people here next week, will you give me some money? How old and were you at this point? I was 18, 19. And the guy looks at me and he's like, yeah, sure. How many people can you bring? And I said, how many people do you hold? He's like 800. I was like, cool, 800. And he looked at me like I was insane. And I went to Kinko's and I made kryptonite entertainment because I like Superman. Okay. And um, I made these flyers and I had these freshman girls pass out flyers with me who I was friends with because I had high school sweethearts. So I was safe. Um, and, uh, and 800 people came the following week. How big is Emery? Um... I don't even know at this point. 800 people to show but up to a party. Yeah. You got a meaningful chunk of the school coming to this party. No, no. Emory's a big school. Like, okay. It's not crazy huge, but yeah. But I, I got I got 800 kids to come, filled up the club. And then at that first party, this actor, Jason Weaver, who was uh, he was little Michael Jackson on the, the Jackson movie on VH1 every single year. Okay. And he, he played, he was in a bunch of movies, TV shows, but I recognized him. I was like, oh my God, it's little Mike. Um, he actually played uh, little Simba in the original Lion King. No it was way. the singing voice. Um, and he walked in and he said, do you want to see how the other half lives? He's like, this party is amazing. You're playing hip hop here with the majority, you know, a lot of these kids, white, black, everything. And I said, what do you mean the other half? And back then Atlanta was very segregated. Atlanta was, you know, they would play techno music for white people and hip hop for black people because the club owners didn't want the crowds mixing. And, um, he brought me to this guy, Alex Gitawan's party. Alex started off as an Ethiopian immigrant in the United States who was a parking lot attendant and then had grown to be the biggest promoter in the city for the black community and now the biggest club owner in Atlanta, Georgia. And um, Alex met me at that first party, was very fascinated that this white boy was so comfortable. Um, and he became a mentor to me. And he taught me how to do cut lines. He taught me how to really promote. He taught me my value with the clubs and what I should be getting. And pretty quickly, we became the largest uh, college party promotion company in the country, revenue-wise. Wow. Were there people asking you if you could even be in the club? You were like 19? Yeah. So, so yeah, that would happen a lot. And I don't, I don't, I've never needed to drink. I've never been a big drinker. Um, so, if I was there and I was underage, I was like, I'm here working. Huh. And, um, and I never needed to take the shots. Like, I never cared about that stuff. Um, I wasn't you know, partying at my own parties. I was there to run the event, yeah. you know, build a business and keep going. And, you know, we started to expand pretty quickly. And then I started helping this this rapper in Atlanta with his manager, Shaka. His name was Chris Lovelove on the radio. His rap name was Ludacris. 
He had a song called Throw Them Bows, and I helped break it in my clubs, and we became friends. That's why he's on Justin Bieber's Baby all those years later. No, f no well, way. How, how would Justin Bieber get ludicrous on his first big single? <laughs> like, there had to be a relationship. I mean, that thing blew up, though. I never biggest song in the country for I don't know how long. So I had that relationship, and then um, this guy was a producer in Atlanta. He had a big billboard when you drove into town called Welcome to Home of So So Deaf. His name was Jermaine Dupree, and he came Jermaine. he came to my parties, and he was like, this is like a New York, L.A. vibe down in the South. Huh. And he said, you got to come work with me. And I became the director of marketing at SoSo Def and then the head of marketing. And I was 20 years old. I dropped out of school and started running SoSo Def. Oh, my God. Were so you, was everything was, was just music? a hustle. Like when you were doing the party. Thing. And I bought, you know, you talk about hustle. I'm not going to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but when I realized that I needed to get the attention of the hip hop community, I needed a way to get the attention. I couldn't just be the white boy in the club. So I made my first bit of money and I went on eBay and I bought a Mercedes Benz CLK with rims that was purple uh, for 30 grand cash on eBay. Dope. And, oh, and it was delivered to me at Frat Row. Um, you still have the car? Oh, I wish I did. I sold it a long time you ago. You need to find it. I need to find it, right? At least a picture of it. Put no, that I in mean, the Scooter Braun me, Museum. Yeah, it's pretty funny. But I would drive it down to the clubs and people would see this kid getting out of this purple Benz with rims. And they'd be like, what's he doing? And that I was faking until I make it, to be honest with you. Wow. Hey, so, if you ain't faking it, you ain't trying. Fair enough. So you, at this point, you're super scrappy. You're finding ways to make money. Was in your mind when you're like, I want to work in the music business, I want to build this? Were, were you thinking that far ahead? Or was it just, hey, this is an opportunity. This guy seems impressive. I guess I should go work for him. No, I never worked for Alex. I, I always worked for myself. He just, I would go I, to- Sorry, I meant I, for yeah. Jermaine. You know, even, oh, so Jermaine. So what happened was I was running my own promotion company. Jermaine's like, I see you have more potential than this. You should come work for me. You could still run your parties. God. And you work for me. And it was this huge opportunity because like, I was like, money ain't a thing. Like, that's Jermaine Dupree. This is great. And, um, and I'd read a book when I was 19 in my dorm room when I started doing this because I started reading about people in the entertainment industry. And I read a book called The Operator about David Geffen, which I don't think David Geffen is a very big fan of. Um, but to me, he, he, there's so many flaws in the book of this man. And it's hard to read about yourself. But to me, this man with flaws became the most powerful person in entertainment history and so successful. And he started off with nothing in Brooklyn and then in a mailroom. And I saw this person as as Batman, like I knew I wasn't going to be Superman. I wasn't born on Krypton. I wasn't going to be able to fly, jump over buildings. But but Batman was human. He just got a bunch of skills and like practiced and became a superhero. And a lot courage. of money and a lot of money. <laughs> True. And but, you know, you, you, you work for it. And and I saw David Geffen is like, wow, you can do this. And there was this one moment in the book um, where he's trying to sign John Lennon's solo career. And I'm literally screaming at the book in my dorm room, like, go to Yoko Ono. Why is no one going to Yoko Ono? Like, everyone's trying to go through the agents, but she's the one. Like, yeah. And I turned the page, and he's the only one who went to Yoko Ono and signed John Lennon. And that was the moment where I realized, I can do this. I think like this. I can do this. Like, I think this way. And then in the book, it said, the fastest way in is music. Because movies take years. TV shows take years. A song can change your life in a night. Even finance takes years. So here I was in Atlanta, Georgia the hotbed of upcoming hip hop. And I'm reading this book that says music's the fast way in. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go into the music business and I'm going to, I'm going to figure out how to be an entrepreneur starting in this place. And that was my inspiration. So you're working with Jermaine Dupree. Yep. Is there, I, and th this could just be out of pure ignorance. Is there anything that is relevant enough to talk about between the time that you started working there and when you discover Justin Bieber, because I'm sure that's what a lot of people ask you. And again, I didn't live your life, so I don't know. So I apologize if it's like jumping over. Very when I look in your eyes, in your I, I think you have lived my life. I feel like we're, we're kindred spirits. Okay. Yeah. I All feel right. like I was working at McDonald's and then I came up with this idea for 100 Thieves. And, you know, I went out and raised $10 million. And it was, uh, I've lived a very special life here as Nate Shot. You really did give us a lot of money, though. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> um uh, <laughs> you know, I, I'll say with, with the Jermaine thing, look, Jermaine was the one who sh showed me that I had an opportunity to live a life bigger than I had ever seen. Jermaine was the first time I'd ever been to L.A. was with him. First time I'd ever been with, to Miami was was with Jermaine. Like he, he, he showed me a, a world outside of anything I'd ever known. And um, I eventually realized that 
what I wanted to do, I needed to go out and do on my own and it wasn't going to be there at Social Def working for Jermaine. But I'll always be friends with Jermaine. I'll always credit for the role he played in my life in spotting me and recognizing me and seeing more talent in me than maybe I even saw myself at that time. Um, so I'm grateful for that. And then I had all these ideas about social media. And to be honest with you, at the time, Jermaine wasn't listening to me. He His formula had worked for so long. He was the most successful producer. Jermaine is the only producer ever to have a number one on the Billboard chart for 16 years straight. Ever. People wow. don't realize. And he writes and produces. So, wow. you know, people don't understand how successful he is as a producer. And his formula had always worked. So I'm having all these ideas about this new thing, Facebook, and this thing, Twitter, and YouTube, and MySpace. And he's like, what is this dude talking about? Like the 21 year old. Like, you know, at the time, I'm 23 when I really start going hard about this. And I end up leaving. Um, and I had all these ideas. A couple things happened in between. And I found this. I said, I'm going to find things that are missing in the marketplace that I believe need that, that could work, but things no one else wants. And that way it'll work for me. So I found this kid on MySpace named Asher Roth. Um, I, I, I love Asher Roth. You found him on MySpace? On MySpace. That is unbelievable. Called him up. Um, they hung up at me because they thought I was the cops trying to shut down their party the first time. <laughs> then Boyder finally realized, you know, it was legit. There was one article about me that was in like, this small Atlanta paper about my career at that point was Jermaine. So I sent that to him to show it was legit. He came on an airplane to see me and we cut two demos in my friend's studio and he was my first artist. I signed him. And then four months after Asher moved down to Atlanta, I was on YouTube in the middle of the night consulting Akon or something else because that's how I made some spare money because I quit parties cold turkey because I said, I'm going to do my own label and I'm not going to focus on parties. This is what I'm going to do. I got enough money 13 to 15 months before I go broke. And um, I found by mistake, this kid, this 12 year old kid singing in a church. And he was singing the same song, Aretha Franklin Respect as the person I was looking at for consulting. So I clicked on the video and related videos thinking it was the same 18 year old and it was a 12 year old. And uh, I watched three, four videos when I saw him sing So Sick by Neo. He had so much soul in his voice. I said, this is the kid I've been looking for. I was a big Michael Jackson fan coming up. And Jackson 5 early days, Michael sang incredible love songs with an angelic childlike voice that made you remember and lo love before you got jaded. So I was like, that's missing in the marketplace. You were actually looking for that before. Yeah, I had actually told Shaka, Ludacris' manager, two weeks before I found Justin, I think this is missing in the marketplace. I want to find something. And uh, somebody upstairs was looking out for me and kind of showed me the way. And then obviously Justin's mom, single mom, different last name. You're on YouTube early days. Like it's not as easy to find people back then. So... I looked at the background of the video and there was a, a sign, a sponsor for the church contest, this company. And I looked up the company and it was in only one part of Ontario. And I called all the school boards of that part of Ontario that day to find him. And his mother called to get rid of me. Like, why are you harassing trying to find my son? And I convinced her to get on the first plane she and he had ever been on. She had never been on a plane before. And they came down to Atlanta and Justin and I have been working together ever since. He was just turning 13. And he's 25 now. I think it's wild that for both Asher Roth and Justin Bieber, you convinced them to fly to you. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get them to trust you? Um, look, it's not like anything was going on for them. Like nothing was going on for me. It was a bunch of like, I'm on the first phone call. They're trying to, you know, yeah. everyone's trying to figure it out. And and luckily there were some references online. So look, you know, I'd done some legit stuff at a, as a young guy. Yeah. So I was in the music business. People could see that. But at that point, I had left so stuff. So I had a Gmail address. So it could have been, you know, they were like, what is going on? Okay. So I feel like you're probably one, the one guest that we've had so far on both the Courage and Inshot show and Self Made, where I think I could just sit here and listen to you talk for like five hours. But I, I don't want to get too <laughs> caught up in all the things that you've done because it seems like from where I'm sitting, your life for pretty much your late teens, your early 20s, and then ever since, it's just been a whirlwind of experiences and doing so many different things. But I, I, I want to hone in really quickly, and then we'll move on to more present day. Your How long are these usually? They're usually an hour. We're going an hour and a half today. Run it. All right. I did this. We've been asking for more. For By the way, Bill Simmons, we did this. Like his thing's usually 45. I think we went for like an hour and a half. We had fun. Well, it makes sense because I think that's probably the one thing that I realized when I took my first meeting with you is that you can speak really, really well. And uh, I'm a big fan of well, that. So can you. Thanks, Scooter. Thanks, Scott. Can I call you Scott now? <laughs> Whatever you want, buddy. All right. Lock it in. So you discovered Justin Bieber. He comes on to Atlanta. Mm-hmm. And then it's just a, a rocket. Nope. 
No. Nope. Okay. Well, <clears throat> inform me. Um, all those early Justin Bieber videos, other than the church, me and his mom were filming. We made it so that I wanted people to feel like the videos are special. So if you watch those early Justin Bieber videos, you'll realize he never looks at the camera and says, my name is Justin Bieber and this song is. We'd always say, just sing. Because we wanted people to think, is this being uploaded by this mom? Do they realize we're watching? Like, you wanted to feel special and have this sense mm -hmm. of ownership. Um, so even like, I uploaded the, you know, uh, With You video by Chris Brown, the first one across a million views. And then it, like early Netflix days, when that one crossed a million, people were like, who is this kid? And people started binging. And videos that literally had just had 60,000 views or 100,000 views within days had millions, 2 million, 3 million, because people were just binging and sharing and binging and sharing. And um, we took Justin from you know, early, you know, 60,000 year and there to before we even walked into a record label to something like 60 million. And uh, 60 million views on YouTube back then. What you what year was that? Because I was on YouTube in 2010. So this was 2000. And let me think. Uh, 2008, 2007, 2000, 2006, 2007. Yeah, because he's 25 now and he, he was 13 then. Yeah, so 2007. Wow. 60 million views in 2007. So we were you insane. Must have been so the six, biggest thing so on the platform. 60 million views in 2007 made Justin the second most watched person on a musician on YouTube in the world. Did this YouTube was before really? he was signed? Before he was signed over every major label artist. But here's the funny thing. The other one was another YouTube artist named, I think it was Esme Denters. I think that was her name. And um, Justin was number two in the world over all these major label artists. But no one had broken off YouTube before. So no label wanted to sign him. Every label said no to us. Did YouTube reach out to you at all about no. doing something bigger? No. Like no one, t like literally it was just me and the couch and like them and like no one was paying attention. We kept building bigger, but I had relationships. So we started going out to try and get him signed and nobody wanted to do the deal. And finally, um, with the help of, uh, of Usher, who I had worked with with the Confessions album with Jermaine, I said, let's go walk him in there and, you know, I'll pull you into the production deal if you can help me get this joint venture to get him signed. And Usher was like blown away by Justin Talent. He's like, I'll walk you in. And it was really funny because the, the meeting we had with L.A. Reid where Usher walked us in, the original meeting, that was the second time Usher had ever met Justin. And Usher walks in, he's like, so Scooter and I have been developing him for the last year and a half. Oh, man. And, <laughs> and I was just sitting there like, just keep my mouth shut and keep this thing works. moving. And the funny thing was I had no intention of ever stepping out and being like a name myself. What happened was Justin is, is like brutally honest and he's a really outspoken kid, you know, at 14, 15, 16. So when he blew up with the song one time and then, you know, One Less Lonely Girl and then Baby and all that stuff that just started to get crazy, um, we would literally do promo every single day because we had to break ourselves because even the label, nobody wanted to deal with us at the label. They, they thought it was a courtesy sign to Usher. Like the, the head of PR at the time said, I don't want the internet kid with the crazy manager. Like it's like nobody. And now Justin's the biggest selling artist they've ever had. And like it, nobody wanted to deal with him and because they didn't believe. So we we got one guy, this guy, Eric Olson, who was the head of radio at the time and Mike Chester, who actually came and worked with me for a long time. There were two promo guys and I became friends with them. And I said, just put us on the road. Tell us where to go. And we got in a van and we just went and we probably broke every child labor law there was <laughs> like just working every single damn day. And Justin wanted it. And but you, Justin and his mom, me, Justin, his mom and Rye Good, who's still like homies with us. And then I added Kenny, who was my buddy who worked at T-Mobile and at the radio station to be a security when things started getting crazy. And we would go everywhere and that would have been the best sitcom ever. <laughs> and Justin would so say, they'd be like, so you're discovered by Usher. And Justin would be like, no, Scooter discovered me. Scooter's my, you know, he would say, that's my guy. We did this. And people were like, who the hell is Scooter? And that's actually how my name got out there. Huh. Wow. I'm kind of like speechless. That's unbelievable. It was. A I mean, story. I've never, I, I've, I know the building blocks of your career, but to hear it just from your mouth yourself is Ridiculous. Okay, so well, we may never say never. You're only allowed two hours for a movie, so we had a little movie magic of like discovered and met Usher, and then we're off. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so you finally get Justin signed. All these songs start taking off. Um, By the way, they didn't even give us a budget to do the songs, even when we were signed. Had a Tricky, pocket. Tricky Stewart was a friend of mine in Atlanta. He was a big producer. He did Umbrella for Rihanna, a bunch of other records, single ladies for Beyonce later on. And I went to him and I showed him Justin. I said, man, this is the one. This is the kid. Like, I just, I'd Asher blown up a little bit. You know, I Love College was huge. So people believed in me and I'd done it so, so deaf. And Tricky said, well, we'll make some songs for you. And we made like an eight song demo, which became that first My World album. 
as literally Tricky did it for the, you know, for the love. And then I paid him after the label was like, oh, this is actually good. We'll pay for this. What was your personal experience like? Because you talk about how you had to take these steps to get these artists' names out there and all of the length, the length that, we, the lengths that you went to make it happen. But I mean, what was going on in like your psyche? Like what, what, what were psyche? you waking at, up every day and thinking? Well, a combination of things. One, I learned that you can't want it, you know, more than they do. You know, as much as you want it, like you need an artist that is willing to put in the work and the grind and everything else. And to Justin's credit, he became as big as he is because he is that competitive and that strong and, and has that much will, even as a young man, that he wanted it. Um, he matched my work ethic day in and day out. Um, number two, I used to think I was driven by fear. I really, really believe that. Like I'm friends with the Yes Theory guys and I was talking to them about that the other day. And um, this idea that the fear of failure you know, I, I can't fail because everyone has these expectations for me. And, and the truth is, as I got older, I learned that's an expectation you build in your own head. The truth is everyone, like Plato said, be kind for everyone walks a hard journey. Everyone has their own bullshit. They really aren't looking at you with these big expectations because they got their own shit to deal with. So what I realized is what drove me was disrespect. What drove me was when people told me I couldn't do it. In fact, when I started to have success later on in life, and people were just like, man, he's great at what he does. I probably got the most complacent I've ever been in my life because I was looking for where the next insult's going to come from. When you tell me I can't do something, I run in that direction. And that's the greatest motivator. And I realized my dad used to do that to me. My dad was a basketball coach. And my dad used to say some really, I love my dad to death. I want to say this before I say this next part. I'm blessed to have a father who cared enough to push me, who cared enough to be there day in and day out. Um, but he said some wild stuff to me to piss me off, to make me play hard. Like I'd go out there in tears sometimes, but wanted to kill because I was so mad because he knew how to push me. And that worked throughout life. So the more people told me I couldn't achieve it, the more people told you, you can't, you can't build 100 Thieves. NBA owners are the only ones that are going to have these teams. You're, you're not going to be able to run a team yourself. You're not going to be able, you're, you're a gamer. You should just sit in the house and, and do what you know. To, you're not going to be able to be the executive on the other side. That was an incredible driving force for you. And I think when I see anybody who's winning, any great movie doesn't have, they don't have Rudy being like, we know you can do it, Rudy. <laughs> you know what, Rudy? You're going to be out on that field in Notre Dame. Like, <laughs> that would have been a very different movie. No, like, but that's my whole point. The great movies are the dad on the couch being like, Rudy, it's never going to happen. No, absolutely. And, you know, and then coming and being proud because you've overcome all the adversity. I completely agree. I mean, that's what has always been the driving force for me. I think early on for me, it was like my mom with like when I first started playing competitive games, she didn't understand it at all. She didn't really under, understand the Internet. So I couldn't like put her I couldn't blame her for that. But it was more like, OK, I'm going to I'm playing for fifty dollars right now. I'm going to win this. I'm going to win this today and I'm going to go show her the $50 that I made. Then I turned to thousands then I turned to 10,000 then hundreds of thousands. So I, I can, that resonates with me so much just because they didn't understand what they didn't know, but they knew that they wanted the best for me, but they pushed me a different way. You know, the funny thing is, is when you're a young man and you're going through that, you assume like, I got to prove you wrong. And when you have good friends and good family, what you find out is they were only doubting you because they don't want to see you in pain. But once you succeed, Absolutely. they have no issue with you proving them wrong because they always loved you anyway. Absolutely. I thought I had to prove everyone wrong in my family. And when I got there, I realized there was nothing I ever needed to prove to them in the first place. They always had my back. The one thing that I noticed is that you're always on your phone. You're always at a meeting. You're always in the middle of something. And I guess sometimes actually when I hang up and we get off the phone together, I'm thinking to myself, how the hell does he keep this all together? Because... At your level of success, have you ever felt overwhelmed? Yeah, absolutely. I would imagine at the point in your career with how many people you're managing and how many people rely on you day in and day out to make decisions or to give them direction, are you ever just thinking to myself, I need to turn off my phone and not talk to anybody for a month. I want to lock myself in my room. Look, the answer is yes, and I take that time. Um, my thing is I have to get to zero on email every single night. Um, I don't have to respond, but I have to see it. And I probably get 2,000 emails a day. Um, get to, get and then 2000 emails a day over the course of the day. Yeah. And then have like an admin they go to. No, I mean, there's a lot of stuff I'm CC'd on, but I kind of have to get to zero before the night's over or I get anxiety. It's like, it's like two things I have to do before I go to sleep. Make sure that me and my wife aren't mad at each other. Make sure I'm zero on emails. <laughs> um, how's that first one go for you? Always. It's a happy marriage. You can never go to sleep mad. It's like one of the most important rules. Of course. Absolutely. And, um, 
you can fight all you want, but before you go to sleep, you got to square it up. And then, uh, you know, look, life is a constant up and down. You know, there's no point when you meet someone who's successful and you're like, you ask them this question of, well, when am I going to be content? At what point with all the success are you content? It's just not how life works. There's days you're sad and there's days you're happy. And, you know, with everything that I've been through and all the things that I've been lucky about in my life, even at 38, there are still days with all the things that have happened to me that I roll over so my wife can't see me and cry myself to sleep because I'm scared of what comes tomorrow. Because I'm scared of how am I going to maintain this? How am I going to do the next thing? What if it all gets taken away? All that fear kind of seeps in and then you get over it. But that's just life. It goes up and down. And when you talk about balance, kind of a couple different things. One, when I was a kid, I had ADD. And it was just starting. I'm, I'm a 1981 baby. So the whole ADD, ADHD was starting when I was in middle school. And they realized, okay, this kid tests really high, but he needs more time because of his attention problem. And they brought my dad and my mom in. They started explaining how they want to give me medicine. They want to give me more time on my test. My dad goes, well, what did they do before ADD? And the teacher's like, excuse me? And they're like, well, what did you do with kids before ADD? And they were like, well, they would suffer and this, that. And he goes, every kid? And they go, well, yeah. And he goes, do me a favor. Don't give my kid any pills. My kid's just lazy. I love that. And I go, I, I was that. like, dad, I get more time on tests. And he's like, no, you don't. You're going to give him the same amount of time. And we're going home. My dad basically was like, you're going to have to work harder if that's the case. And to his credit, ADD became my superpower. Because the way my brain works is I had to train myself to, instead of seeing it as a disadvantage, it was my advantage. I can do a lot of things at the same time and balance a lot of things quickly in my head. So it's no longer a distraction, it's an ability. And if I would have just taken the pills and numb myself, I would have never had to put in the work. It's really unfair that Superman got like super strength. Yeah, laser no, I got ADD. Got ADD. <laughs> <laughs> In some alternate universe, Scooter, you probably have it. I'm yeah, but you know, but look, here's the thing. You learn balance. You learn that if you go to sleep and you wake up in the morning, you know, I've read this thing where Jeff Bezos said he has to sleep eight hours a day because if he doesn't, it's unfair to his shareholders because he doesn't get, you know, he's not as productive. And I'm like, if that dude can get proper sleep, all of us can get proper sleep. That's what I tell John, so I'm not cranky the next day. He, <laughs> he understands. But it, it's the truth. I mean, if you if you do that, if you have that balance, if you take the time to sometimes turn off the phone. And the other thing is I got three kids. I'm going to be present in their life. What's the point of doing all this unless I'm a good dad? And, and you have kids, dude. Do you have like an all pair or anything? Yeah, we, we have we have help. But at the end of the day, we put the kids to sleep every oh, night. I know, I know. I'm, just I'm saying. saying. No, I'm saying. But we put the kids, like, it's important to me. I got to be home to put the kids to sleep every single night. I'm in L.A. And I'm in L.A. most times. And I wake up with my kids. Like, I got a superhero and a wife. Like, a true superhero. And, and you figure out the life and you figure out the balance. And there's times you drop the ball and there's times you pick it up. But you just keep trying and working towards it. I feel like Jackson and I, well, I think you're a lot more organized than me. Absolutely. I mean, not a lot more. But Jackson's always late stuff. to things. That's one, one, one of Jackson's fault. But I feel like right now I'm running only one business and I have a lot of help and I don't have any kids. I have no relationship and I still sometimes feel overwhelmed. But like, how the f am I going to do this? You, you just said it. You have a lot of help and no, no good business person does it themselves. You stand on the shoulders of a lot of people. And my organization, I make sure I'm never the smartest person in the room. And I make sure that I have people that are experts in what they do and I rely heavily on them. And, and that's how you figure out. And then you also can't have FOMO. Like you, you have to be okay knowing that you're not going to get everything. With your job right now and all the things that you're involved in, I see that there is so many different people, especially with social media, with how much access everybody has now to each other's lives. There's always a lot of positive comments, but there's also a lot of negative comments. And I think for somebody like you who manages so much talent where they're so involved in your life too. How do you deal with negative criticism? Like how do you deal with people tell you that you shouldn't be doing this or this isn't how you should be handling yourself? How do you deal with negative comments? Well, look, I think unfortunately we're living in a world where sometimes people just don't have all the facts. Um, uh, but I think accountability is a good thing. I think like the way I look at it, the bad thing is that when it becomes overwhelming for people and you're getting a tremendous amount of hate for no reason and it's not based in any kind of truth. And the good thing about the foundation my parents gave me is I know my truth. I know who I am. Um, my grandfather, you know, used to say, be silent in the storm. Um, and, you know, when the storm comes, just stay still, know your truth, keep your head up, take the high road and the storm will pass. And in the end, what I've learned throughout my career, I've been in points in my career where it just feels like the world is ending. But... 
you stay true. And in a couple of years, the truth always comes out and people see what it is. And, and in the end, if you're on the good side of truth, it always works out. Um, so I've always been confident in that nothing really phases me because of that. And then the other thing is having clients of the size that I, excuse me, I do. Um, what I tell them is when you have a hundred million people following you and I do not, I do not have a hundred million people, but when you have a hundred million people following you and 10,000 are screaming at you, that can be incredibly overwhelming. 10,000 people writing you at the same time. You're this, you're that, you're this, but 10,000 is less than 1%. It's not real. It's not your truth. It's just the fact that they happen to have access and I'm not going to give, you know, my happiness away because of a small, loud minority. Um, so, you know, I, I don't really get phased by that. If my wife loves me, my friends love me and the people I work with love me, um, and I can love them back. And I know that I make decisions, you know, based in morality and based in a long-term, you know, strategy for helping others. Um, then I'm perfectly content with what I'm doing. And I, and I understand at times in my business there, you know, there are people who will hear different narratives and everything else. But in the, in the end, the, the truth always comes out. If you know your truth, you're going to be okay. I feel like a lot of YouTubers can hear that. I think one phenomenon that I sort of grew up with spending my time on YouTube is that there is so many people that sometimes break down because of how negative comments can be. And I think you just hit the nail on the head. It's, it's the, the negative comments are always the loudest. It's because it's like, Positive reinforcement in a lot of ways is a good thing, but I think negative comments can be a driving force like we talked about earlier, but they can also like break you down. And a lot of, a lot of young kids who had grew up with a normal life and now are like thrusted into some sort of stardom, but it's some capacity on YouTube and the negative comments, I would say for me specifically too, always got to me. But I mean, when you put it like that and just think about it logically and really break it down of what the situation actually is. It could be a really, really big help for a lot of people. What have you learned about working with the biggest talent in the world and obviously very high highs and very low lows? And oftentimes it comes with what people are saying. But I look at someone like Bieber's career over the last 10 years and just literally mountaintops and very low valleys. Has a lot of the stuff you said about pushing yourself, has that been kind of your North Star? Do you think about each person kind of obviously individually, but has there been anything that kind of culminates as this is how I have to guide these people? Well, look, the first thing is they're humans. You know, it, to other people, it's Justin Bieber, it's Ariana Grande, it's Demi Lovato, it's Kanye. Like, these are all human beings. And human beings are not made to be worshipped. We're made to serve. So when you're putting people in a position where they're being worshipped, that can really, you know, mess with somebody's head. Because that's, we're not built for that. Mm. Um, so... The best advice I ever got for being a manager or being an executive is actually from great parents. And a great parent will tell you, be a rock, be a stable place. Don't be a place of judgment 24 seven, be a place where they know when they're ready for advice, they know they're, you're a safe place to turn. Um, so I'm never gonna lie, I'm never gonna yes man, but I'm gonna be steady in where I stand, but they also have to make their own decisions. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's hard because sometimes people will judge you based on their decisions. Um, but what kind of a person would I be where I, you know, if I walked away from them just because I didn't like what they said that day as they're going through their growing process in front of the entire world? You know, so my, you know, my feeling is their family. Um, I care about them. And my job is to be a place where they can go for something real. Um, I can, you know, I'm, I'm there to help run the business and help to do all that. But I remember watching the Amy Winehouse documentary years ago and she was really sick. And the manager was like, my job wasn't to handle that. It was to just get her on stage. Wow. And I wanted to jump through the screen and hurt the guy. You know, when you get put in this position, people need you to be there for them. It doesn't mean that you're responsible. Um, because even what I learned in Alan on meetings, like it's not, it's not, you know, I'm never going to change an addict. No, it's your, your job is to be there as a stable place for when they're ready to change. And I think that's any human relationship. You're not responsible. I'm not responsible for your actions, but I'm, I'm, if I'm your friend and I care about you and I'm family to you. Best friends. Yeah. Best friends, man. I mean, my responsibility is to give you honest advice and help when you ask for it. Hmm. And I think that if you just take all these big names down to a human level, my job is to be a human with them. And that's, that's all you can do. So obviously 
you've built such a successful career in, in, in music specifically, but I feel like that is sort of understanding what you do now or however long you've been doing it. Um, can you talk a little bit about like what gets you excited um, beyond music? Obviously, you're an investor, philanthropist. I nailed that word, philanthropist. I wonder if you want to try it again. That. One, two, three. Philanthropist. Oh, he did well. Ja- Jackson, do you, uh, don't you? Aren't you a philanthropist? I, I don't. Anomaly. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Uh, right working now? on it. What else? What else are you up to? Because, like, how much money you got? What? <laughs> this is Matt's favorite question. No, that's my favorite question. Uh, actually, wait. I wonder if you would answer this because no, I only I had won't. one person that would answer this. I won't answer that. You won't answer it. You know what I? Come I, on, we're, we're young kids. We want to hear it. Okay, here's what I'll tell you. What was the biggest check you ever received in your life? Here's what I'll tell you. I had a number. This is actually a good lesson. This is what I will tell you. I had a number that when I was I, when I was 19 and I started, I was like, I want to be a billionaire, and then I realized making five grand is hard, and I had to reassess. I'm like, being a billionaire is completely unrealistic. Like. I've met this guy in Atlanta and he had a great family, a dog, a little whaler boat. I was like, man, this life is the best. How much do I need? And he gave me a number. And I was like, that's attainable. I can get that. If I work really hard, I can maybe get there in my 40s and my 50s. When I was 27 years old, I was driving down the street by Cactus Car Wash on Piedmont Road uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. And my accountant called me to say that something had to come through and this had come through. And I called him back and I said, how much money do I have in my account? And he said a number bigger than my lifetime goal because of that guy. And I was 27. And I remember calling my dad and saying, dad, I need to tell you something. And now I'm 27, I'm telling my father I'm the wealthiest person in the family by far. And my dad was like blown away and excited. And he was like, well, what, what do you think? And I was like, I'm actually super depressed. And he goes, why? And I said, because I always thought when I reached this number that was it. That, that was it. I'd be happy that I'd be I'd be good. Yeah. And now I'm still just driving down Piedmont Road by Cactus Car Wash and nothing has changed. What now? What now? And my dad goes, do me a favor. One of the best pieces of advice he ever gave me. He said, I want you to hang up the phone. I want you to think about the things that made you happy over the last year. And I want you to call me back. It took five minutes calling back. I said, honestly, playing pickup basketball, my friends, late night conversations, giving kids tickets, you know, the cliche stuff. And my dad goes, I think this money that you're going to make for the rest of your life, this money is for you to have more time to implement those things. And I realized money can be as, you know, it could trap you. You can get caught in that rat race if you don't have perspective and it can destroy you. And that's why we see fortune 500 CEO kill himself. And we'll be like, Oh my God, how could they? But we're not surprised, but you never see someone who works at a soup kitchen, kill themselves and be like, Oh my God, how could they and not be surprised? You're shocked. How could someone who give their life to giving ever kill themselves? Because when you're in service to others, you're happy. So my thing is, I think money just gives you an opportunity to implement more good into your life. You can't let it trap you. It actually is a freeing thing if you put it out the right way. So I've been free for, um, I think it's Valkyrie walking around. Hi, Ray. (laughs) Shooter's here. Scott. Hi. Um, I think money is an opportunity for you to have more freedom. Here's a question um, for you. I think a lot of people... Wait, wait, wait. How much money you got? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just t- so emotional. Like such a-, <laughs> a lot of people have this mindset of... That, that resonates. That makes a ton of sense. Money, freedom, blah, blah, blah. But I'll feel that way once I get to the number. Yeah, I hear that all the time. How do you... How do you balance? And obviously, it's it's been a while now that, and I'm sure you're well, well, well. Look, if if if, if, that? if Jeff Bezos woke up tomorrow with my money, he might kill himself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, like it, well, it's, he might after the divorce. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean he like it's it's all relative. Like you're never. There's always going to be somebody bigger, yeah. right? So what I'm telling you is, they'll say, "Oh, that's nice to have that mindset." You get there, and I'm the first one to say that's correct. If you can't pay your mortgage. If you can't pay your rent, if you can't put food on the table the next day, you are in a lot more of a stressful position than I am. I 100% understand that because I used to be there. I remember paying for pizza with change when I realized I didn't have enough money to pay for freaking pizza that night because I was broke. Like, and that was when people thought I was killing it. Yeah. You know, so I, I know what that feels like. But at the same time, I can tell you everything in life is perspective. You know, you are lucky. If you're born in a first world country, there are people literally right now risking everything to come to a country where someone is at the highest office telling them you're not wanted. 
yet they're still just trying to get here. Yet you're here and you're looking at someone else's success saying, well, my life's not there. Stop counting other people's money. Take what you got and appreciate it and build from there. Now, I feel really bad for asking you how much money you got. Nah, no problem, buddy. Sorry, Scooter. No problem. It's a self-made podcast. You are the definition of a self-made man. Okay, we talked about the money. I asked my <laughs> stupid question. It didn't I do want to go back to what you were getting at before you asked how much money you had, which is <laughs> you've obviously you're one of the most <laughs> impactful people in music in the world and probably in history. Well, you weird moved, when you guys say that, but okay. Hey, we're telling you, we're it, not I, saying it. It's true. Uh, you've moved into film and television. You moved into investing in technology. Obviously, you've moved into gaming. How do you, and maybe it's changed over time, but how did you initially approach, I'm going to move beyond where I'm at? And maybe even going from party promoting to music. But like when you dive into a new world that you're not an expert in, you don't have all the mm -hmm. the whole playbook for, how do you approach it? Um, a couple of things. One, I, I have to wake up and be curious. The day I stop having curiosity, you might as well just put me in the grave. Like, I, I just, I love being curious. I love, you know, seeing the world through my children's eyes because that's a children's curiosity is like the greatest. Um, but for me, it was like, how do I do this music? Okay, now I've done, you know, hip hop. How do I do pop? How do I now do country with this band, Dan and Shay? Okay, now do, how do I do, you know, EDM with this kid, Martin Garrix? Okay, how do I do a film? You know, how do I do a TV Wait, show? you work with Martin Garrix? We found Martin when he was 17 years old and I'd signed him out of, uh, out of Club Med in Punta Cana. I called the Club Med and told them that I was at school and it was an emergency and I had to get in touch with him. <laughs> Holy shit. And you got Kenny Chesney. Um, and, and, uh, Wait, oh, don't you? Is it no, not no, anymore? no. People, people know we have a partnership with Sorry. Ken Hingham. His, Kenny's manager is a partner of mine. And okay. we have that. No, that's pretty public. It's okay. pretty out there. All right. I'm going to reel it back. No, in. no. No, it's okay. Ken, like Ken, Kenny tells people. Um, but look, we have, we have a really... It's, it's fun, but here's the thing. Very simply, and I tell people all the time, when I meet someone that has a burn the ships mentality, that's when I want to bet on that person. Hmm. When I met Travis from Uber and Uber was just in San Francisco and you sat with him. I have this picture I posted when the IPO happened of Travis on my couch, like pitching us in LA. I was already an investor and he's like, it's coming to Los Angeles. This is what it's going to do. This is where I need your help as an investor. Like you met that dude and I would talk to him about relationships and he's like, man, I'm married to Uber. Like he was burn the ships on Uber. And what I mean by burn the ships is this, this story of the generals would arrive on the ships of their enemies and they would tell their own so soldiers, burn the ships. The only way you're going back to your, your children and your families is if we take the ships of our enemies, if we win, there is no retreat. And when you have that mentality, there's, you have no other choice but to figure it out because only death is failure. Every day you wake up in the morning, you got another opportunity to win. So when I met Travis, he had that mentality. When I met Daniel Eck from Spotify, he had that mentality. When I met, you know, Ariana, she had that mentality. When I met Justin, he had that mentality. Like, to be honest with you, I had spoken to a lot of people in esports. I made the bet on 100 Thieves because he had that mentality. He had that, I'm, a, I'm from this world, this is my world, and we are going to do this, and we're going to build something special, and I'm sticking to my guns and my morality on how I'm going to do it. And... I had to become a partner in this organization because Matt 100% was head down, burn the ships. I'm taking the ships of my enemies. He's living it. Yeah, but not only living it, like there was no retreat. And he had this great general on his side named John Robinson, <laughs> the bald-headed warrior. No, he's like my, he's like <laughs> my captain. The last podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He just compared me to Justin Bieber and Ariana Grande. It's going on my Instagram. Please leave a like. Just the, the clip. Right you know, there. the best part is he, he didn't hear any of like the big tech entrepreneurs. He just heard Justin Bieber and Ariana. Now I heard Travis. Was, you got Uber money. That's crazy. Uh, I, I want to push you on. I want to push you on that a, just okay. a little bit. <laughs> I'm going to unplug myself. <laughs> push him. Push him. I just need to. I need a muzzle. <laughs> you know who also, but also had the mentality. And I want to shout him out because he'll get upset if I don't tell him. John Zimmer from Lyft and I went to high school together. He was two years younger no than way. me. No way. He was two years. Both Uber yeah. and Lyft. And one of the very few I have met. How did you pull that off? Long story. Yes. Um, but John, as, as Travis is the reason Uber where it is today, in my opinion, and John, every other company everyone thought would get swallowed. And the reason that they didn't is because of John. Hmm. You know, it's just when you have that competitive spirit and that spirit of like, I'm not afraid of failure. Failure is just a pit stop. You're like... Pale, failure is the, the lodge on the ski slopes on the first one you go up you get the you know the coffee or the hot chocolate i get on the next one i keep going you know and and that's all it is and you've had that from the day i've met you you know and and, and you, the other thing is like there's nothing that scares you because you're like 
coming from what I come from, like everything is a holiday. Let's go. I'm afraid of a lot of things. Screw flying, food poisoning, getting sick. You're afraid of heights? No, food poisoning. But you said flying. Yeah. Are you afraid of flying? Yeah. Can I can I actually ask something of hundred thieves right now since I did your podcast? Yeah. I want to take you from this YouTube podcast platform. And I want to ask if we can have a shared YouTube moment with another group of uh, guys on YouTube with me and you. Well, you need to tell me what that is first. I uh, am issuing you a challenge right now on the on the uh, self-made podcast. That I, since I did this, you, me, and the Yes Theory guys are going to jump out of a plane together. Oh, no, no, no. Absolutely. My, my hands just started sweating. Scooter, can I tell you a story? Yes Theory. I want, where, where can, can I look in? Tell me. Camera. Clip it out. Okay. This is a challenge to the Yes Theory guys. It's one of the biggest personalities in gaming in the world. I want to, you know, get him to jump out of a plane. Scooter, because let me you guys I know don't do anything with gaming. You don't do anything gaming because you want people outdoors. You don't like their the whole thing. They never do anything. I go outdoors. I golf. So we're gonna get this guy outdoors. We're gonna take him away from the vlogging. We're gonna have him jump out of a plane. Scooter, I'll do it too. Really quick. Oh my god. Let, let me tell you tell your story really quickly before we decide to do that. When I was with Red Bull in 2013, I was the first Red Bull athlete for Call of Duty. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple years later, they're doing a campaign with Destiny and Walmart. And their idea was that they wanted us to jump out of a plane and land next to the first Walmart and deliver Destiny to the first customer. Yeah. At the time, I was like, absolutely. That sounds incredible. Let's do it. And so it gets closer to the event and we have to figure out how to jump out of a plane. And so they take us to an airstrip in Illinois and they tell me the first time that I jump out of a plane, I'm going to take a six hour course inside the classroom and then I'm going to jump out of that plane by myself. There was no option to do like a tandem no, we'll jump. Tandem. We'll do tandem. Okay. There was no option to do a tandem jump. No, I'm giving you the option. I know, but you got to hear the that's rest an, of the story. That's insane. Let me finish the story. So they wanted me to jump out of this plane by myself. I'm like, nope, absolutely not. Not happening. You know, at that point, I was like, you know what? I'm making some money. I'm getting close to where I thought I could get with all this gaming stuff. I'm like, I'm not going out like this. You know, I'm going to enjoy this. I like, I'm not getting two years removed from McDonald's and and splattering on that floor and so we get we go home and they need to make me a, uh, i need to make a game time decision by the next day and whether i'm going to jump out of this plane or not because then it starts to get certified or whatever so we get to the airstrip and i'm still sort of on the fence like maybe i'll just man up maybe i'll just do it there was competitive skydivers at this strip practicing for an event hand to god you could talk to hector rodriguez the owner of optic gaming who was one my, on this podcast? One, who was on this podcast? One of my best Scooter friends. Stuff. I know, and better friend than me. <laughs> Listen, as we're walking into the building, one of the competitive skydivers tries to do what they call a red turn too close to the ground, slams straight into it, breaks both his legs. The day that I was supposed to decide whether I hold on a minute, have a tandem. Well, hold on, hold on, slow down. Where they did, they jumped out of a plane. They didn't jump out of a plane. They were doing a practice thing. Well, no, they. Yeah, how do you practice jumping out of a plane? Jump out of a plane. They but jumped someone out of plane. jumped out of a plane and hit the ground and just broke their leg? No, they had the parachute out. Oh. He did a red turn with his parachute. Red turn is like... Yeah, you're but you're not going to turn. We're going to go tandem and that's it. You're just going to jump out of a plane. All right. If Scooter goes, I'll go. Okay, I'm going. This We're doing amazing. it. Amazing. I'm very excited. Good for content for 100 Thieves. You make a lot of great content, Scooter. And maybe Matt will fly places after we do this. It'll be amazing. No, the problem, the problem that I have with flying is that... Benny Blanco, very big producer, is a really close friend of mine. I'm seeing him tonight. He doesn't fly. And you he will take, me to Benny Blanco. He will take a tour bus all around the country. If you watch the Ed Sheeran's movie Songwriter, him and Ed, he had to go to London to write the rest of the album. And so him and Benny got on the QE2 and set up a studio and went across the ocean in a boat because Benny's so afraid of flying. No They went on way. a boat? Well, the problem, the problem with flying is that I understand the statistics. Everyone's like, okay, this is how you're going to curb your anxiety. You're going to understand the statistics and what is actually happening while you're flying. And then you're going to understand it. That's what Jack tells me. He's like, I used to be afraid to go sleep over at my friend's house when I was a kid. And then my, my therapist explained it to me. It's like, why are you afraid? I know why I'm not supposed to be afraid of flying. But the facts still remain that you're being flown by two people that you have never met, surrounded by hundreds of people that you don't know, going 500 miles per hour, 30,000 feet in the air in an aluminum tube. Those are a lot of variables that I'm just not comfortable with. And the, what's the messed up part about it is that when I was 16 flying to events, I thought this was the coolest thing in the world. Let's and go. statistics are much likelier that you die in a car accident. Yeah, but I'm driving, so I know it ain't going to happen. It's That's the other not driver. not true. I know, I know. I By the way, this jump is out of a plane. 
and then it's all gonna be fake. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the uh, least viewership we've ever had here. <laughs> oh, wait, people are gonna love this. All right, let's get back on track. All right, so what other companies are you investing in besides Hundred Thieves? Well, you're a co-owner of our. Co- are there any other like majority companies that you're like a co-owner in, or is Hundred Thieves really special? Uh, we have our company Ithaca, and so I'm a you know owner in that. Okay. okay. And then uh, we have other companies within that company, and then I just invest in a bunch of different things. Kind of keep just following curiosity. Uh, curiosity, doing research, looking for things that are missing in the marketplace. Maybe I, I like to find things that can help people. I like to create leverage in different industries so that I can kind of, you know, be able to move and, and be able to be productive. The most important thing for me is never have someone say that, um, I was a bad partner. You know, I won't, I always want to be able to, when it's said and done to say that I was a good partner, that I, that I, you know, made my partner's money, that I, I helped make a difference in whatever they were doing. You know, I try to do that with 100 Thieves. And, you know, we invest in money, but I try to, more than money, I try to be a pro. Way more than money. I think that's something that people money. might miss too, just in investing in general, but certainly for your involvement, it's not like the money is obviously important, but we could get money from a lot of people. Um, and when you find the right partner who truly moves the needle, we, we talk about it, but like on a weekly basis at minimum, you are doing something impactful to help us, whether it's a relationship or or any number of other things. And I think that that might be something that, they see the $35 million or whatever the money raised and they miss that side of it. And I think there are, we're, we're really lucky to get to work with a lot of really amazing people and you're at the top of the list. So Scooter, you, can I beat you in a three point basketball shootout? No. Okay. We should do this for a video too. I've heard um, a rumor about your jump shot. Why would you do that to yourself? That is because well, you're getting smoked. I'll get smoked. Yeah. What's, what's the bet? Uh, that <laughs> back pedal. <laughs> you do play a lot of pickup basketball, huh? What about no, golf? I'm do you a, golf? Nope. You don't golf? Nope. I thought you no? Nope. I've golfed like four times in my life. You should come golfing with me. I'll come golfing with you. I won't make any bets on it because I'm smart. But if you want to make a bet on basketball, I'm happy to do it. You're on the high school team? You were Zach, Zach Efron. I don't think I should do this. I, 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 would I was like exactly like Zach. I would literally just start singing and dancing in the middle of the court. That's why your dad was <laughs> yelling at you. <laughs> it's just like high school musical. <laughs> okay. Amazing. Jackson. Okay. So we didn't really talk about it earlier, but I am curious. You've since expanded beyond it, but clearly entertainment has been this through line through the vast majority of what you've done. Was that something that when you were 18, you knew, I want to I want to work in entertainment, I want to build in entertainment? Or was it something that you kind of fell into? And have- Look, I, I didn't know if I wanted to be a basketball coach. I might, might have wanted to be a lawyer, like a politician. I didn't know what it wanted to be, but I wanted to have a voice. I think if you look at all those, like a lawyer or a politician or, or a coach, I wanted to do something in a type of leadership position um, and some kind of place of you know guidance, I guess, if I look back at it now. Um, I wanted to contribute, but... I think entertainment, I read that book and that kind of changed my life. And I was in a place where, you know, I, I was able to step in and, and have this career. Um, but I didn't have like a five-year plan. It was kind of like just a kid, you know, thinking big and going for it. Um, but, you know, it's, entertainment's a funny thing. You know, there's, I think every morning I have to wake up and luckily I married an amazing woman who helps me with this, but you got to chop the pedestal. You know, you got you can't think you're so big or you've achieved so much. There's always someone who's achieved less. There's always someone who's achieved more. And the truth is, in 100 years, no one's really going to remember me. They might feel my impact, and that's important to me. But there's very unlikely people are going to be sitting around in 100 years, like, just speaking my name because, regardless of what I achieve, there'll be someone else achieving at that time. Um, so I think it's more important just to stay humble and be kind and not get caught up in the moment. Um because the entertainment business, very funny way, it's so high profile, it's easy to get caught in that echo chamber of thinking your shit is the most important shit in the world. And the truth is, it's not. You know, what I deal with most of the time with entertainment is really high level, high viewed inconveniences. You know, my wife's the founder of cancer. My wife deals with people with chemo. Like, that's a problem. That's not an inconvenience. That's a problem. So, very few times do I have to deal with problems. There have been a couple times in my career where very unfortunate things have happened. And I've had to step up with a group of amazing people and deal with the problem. But most of the time, I don't have problems. Have you ever written a book yet? No. Are you going to write a memoir? Uh, it, it, it just, it, I was actually just thinking about doing a biography on you. Yeah? Yeah, just like because I'm, I'm the world's premier expert on Nate Shot. When the New York Times I think we need a couple more yeah. years. 
Yeah. No, I think I could write or it right still now. Still to be done. You should write it. I mean, it, it'd, it'd be the amount called, of examples. How much have. money do you have? <laughs> hey, listen, this is my show. I, that, I run a tight that, ship. I can ask do you really ask people every single time? Every single time. Really? Granted, I've only asked my friends. <laughs> <laughs> Has anyone answered? Uh, yeah, I mean, one did, but I knew he was going to answer. Why would anyone answer that? Because it, it's fun. How much money do you have, Matt? Oh. Don't answer. Do not answer. I'm not going to tell you Do that. not answer. I don't want you to. A uh, lot. Not I'm enough. No, <laughs> it's all relative. I uh, know. Exactly. I, listen, then, let me have my fun. I'm so, <laughs> I, now I'm just feeling judged. No, you shouldn't feel judged. You're an amazing it's guy. The whole place. reason I'm here is because I actually believe in you guys so much. I appreciate that, Scooter. Appreciate that. So you, you hit your number, 27. You've done so much since then. When you think about what brings you happiness, obviously a lot of it is outside of work, and I'm sure some of it is in work. What, what is the ambition now? Is it more just opportunistic? Do you have a dream or a place you're trying to get to now? Is it more about legacy? What I mean, is success? Honestly, and I've had a lot of time to think about this. As you, as you get older, you think about all these things more and more. You get deeper and deeper. And I'm sure 10 years from now, I'll have a lot more perspective. Um, I, I, I can't be beaten right now. Hmm. Like you can't beat me. You can't say anything to me that's going to take away my success or my happiness because I have Yale and my kids. You know, my wife and my children, I've won. Like that's the hardest thing I'll ever do, finding her. You know, and you can't find that. It happens or it doesn't. And I found her and I have my, my three children and there's nothing you can take away from me as long as I have them. You know, like it's so... So I feel really blessed and, 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 and positive because of that. Um, the rest of it is I'm playing with house money and I'm going for it as big as I possibly can because I only got one time to do this thing. So why not have as much fun and make the journey as wild and as crazy a story as I possibly can? You know, instead of just reading about stories like I was 19, now I'm trying to write one, you know, so, but there's nothing that, you know, so there's nothing about it that like I'm, I'm waking up and I'm like, oh my God, if you don't achieve this today, that that that's the thing i said every once in a while you'll have those thoughts but the truth is i would be incredibly depressed if all this happened to me and i didn't have people to share with the highlight of my year is when one of my sons who can speak my daughter can't speak yet just randomly leans over and goes daddy i go yeah and he goes i love you daddy like that's better than any grammy tour award any anything there's nothing better than getting a hug and a kiss from your kid like so when you ask me about what do i define as success what I find is being self-made, man, you could, you could have a job that pays you nothing. But if you have the love of your children and, and, and your spouse, you're self-made in my, my opinion. I feel the same way about Jackson when he says and does all that to me. It's fair. Probably you should. You guys have something really special. <laughs> you, me and Jackson are very lonely. <laughs> please, 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 please I'm help waiting me. for that to happen. Let's say that. Let's say that. How old are you guys now? Uh, 25, 26. Yeah, it didn't happen for me at that age. So you got time. Scooter, will you come to my birthday party? When is it? August 3rd. Soon. No, I'll be at the. Uh, oh, you can be in Lollapalooza. Nope. With I'll Ariana, going, I'll be going to Lollapalooza because she's doing uh, the next day. But I will be at Canton, Ohio, for Tony Gonzalez being inducted in the Hall of Fame. Tony Gonzalez is a champion. We should have him on Self Made. I would love to talk to Tony Gonzalez. Should I get Tony Gonzalez to come on Self Made? Absolutely. I swear, I'm going to invite Tony Gonzalez to Self Made. He's one of the greatest of all time, and he is the greatest tight end of yeah. all time. Why are the New York Jets the worst NFL team in the league? Listen, I don't know if we're the worst NFL team in the league, but I think it's very important that my children growing up on the West Coast remain like their father, a diehard Jets fan, because my, my children are growing up in a lifestyle that no one in my family has ever had. And it's a really extraordinary, it's amazing lifestyle. Shit. And every Sunday during the football season, they will be humbled <laughs> and they will know pain. Will and Sam Darnold carry you guys to a Super Bowl? I, I don't know. But when my oldest son, Jagger, was born, um, my wife had finally fallen asleep after 18 hours of labor and I was holding my, my firstborn in my hands and I started weeping because I was imagining that the Jets might win a Super Bowl and we would watch it together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, wait, are you a Knicks fan or a Nets fan? Uh, I grew up a Knicks fan, diehard Knicks fan. And the it's Nets were in New Jersey that. when I was growing up, but the Nets are in Brooklyn now. And uh, I got so much love for Katie. And I know that. And Joe Sy, who's the owner over there, is a really good dude. And like, you know, so I'm, I'm rooting for him. Um, my best friend works for the Heat organization. So... I show love to him, but at my core, I'm a dire Knicks fan, and I have season, season tickets to the Clippers the last four years, so I'm really happy right Whoa, now. Whoa, what so, a year to have those. You, gonna come, you want to come with me to a game? Matt is now your best friend. Yeah, you want to come with me to a game and see a little Paul George and uh, Kawhi? 
I would absolutely come to a game. Cool. You jump out of the plane. We go to the game. <laughs> Why are we adding so many layers to this? The stakes. Have been Just want to make sure you follow through. That's Wait, all. Wait, wh- where are your seats? Where do you think they are? I don't know. I'll jump out of there. There's a section way up top. Way up top in the Raptors? Yeah. I don't want to go with you. I'll, okay. I'll get my own tickets. You should go. We got good seats. We got really good seats. The okay. Clippers weren't as good at the time, and now they're really good, and we got good seats. I'll you're going to okay, enjoy I'm gonna go. I'm going to be going a lot now with that squad. I would imagine you would be. Um, that's fantastic. Well, look, I think, uh, Jackson, do you have anything else? One last thing, which is we talked about the wide ranging ambition, all you've accomplished, your family. I think the other recurring theme in your career has been, and you talked about it a little bit with the worship and service thing, is you give back and find a way to give back in just about everything you do. How, how is that something that you kind of balance along with there's, there's lots of opportunities to potentially do something nice or serve every now and then, but for the most ambitious people in the world who are pushing business forward and all these things, I think it can be hard to find the room for that. How is that something you've made time for? And um, how do you think about service more broadly? One, you got to prioritize it. Um, my mother made sure it was a priority in my life growing up. Now I'm married a philanthropist. So, you know, my brother started Pencils of Promise. Like it's, I have a lot of philanthropy around me. Um, so it was always something really, really important to me. Uh, it's also statistically proven that a for-profit business with a nonprofit component actually does better because people want to support it. Mm -hmm. I hate the word nonprofit. My brother actually changed that. It should be called for purpose. It shouldn't be what you don't do, which should be what you do. And, um, you know, I think, uh, I think I'm a selfish person, like a really selfish person. And I like to feel good and nothing makes me feel better than doing that stuff so selfishly i want as much of it in my life as possible and we hired uh shauna who really runs our family foundation and our entire business is uh philanthropic efforts so when you see ariana you know donating to planned parenthood or helping people adopt dogs at every state uh, shop uh, stop on the tour or justin building multiple schools around the world with pencil of promise or uh tori kelly you know, giving back or Martin teaching kids in inner city Miami, you know, how to DJ, um, all of these different things. Sean is helping set up the programs with us and working through. And I, and I think that's really, really important. It makes people feel good about what they do. I've never met anyone who said no to doing something to give back. Um, you just need to give people that opportunity. And we joke around that our jobs to make the money. Sean, Shauna's job is to give it away. Um, and you know, right now while I'm speaking to you guys, we're running, uh, our, our youth leadership fellowship right now for the next week. And we have inner city youth um, for all over the greater Los Angeles area um, who we brought in to be youth activists and we're training them right now because I think that that's the best thing you can do. Awesome. What an example. I really didn't know a lot of the things that you laid out here for me today. What, this was what did you not know? Everything. <laughs> he just had no interest in me whatsoever. I had a ton of interest, <laughs> but what do you want me to go do? A Google friend, you? not a best friend. Yeah, I didn't want to be too invasive. I, I just wanted to keep my relationship with Scooter like, okay, he needs or he wants 100 Thieves to be successful. And I I'm going to do everything I can to make 100 Thieves a success. I do. And by the way, Drake doesn't do a lot of stuff. Like, I've, I've sent a lot of stuff to him over the years. And, well, uh, you know, the fact that, you know, he uh, he jumped in as, a, as an owner is a, is a big deal. Why are you laughing so hard? <laughs> Just came out of left field. He commented on my Instagram yesterday. It was dope. It Why made did my, that come out of left field? You just get excited that he commented on your Instagram? Uh, no, no, no. It can't, I, I would just, uh, never mind. I, I remember Drake's an investor in his company. Yeah, no, yeah, Drake, I mean, that was like... He's an owner. Yeah, he's a co-owner. Fair enough. I, uh, it's Champagne Poppy. It's like, a, it's a very interesting position to be in because like back in 2011, well, even, even before that, like uh, with Thank Me Later and Take Care, that was like the music that I was listening to in high school that was getting me through my job. And I was always been a biggest, I've been, I'm like one of Drake's biggest fans. Well, the funny, the funny and thing I can't is, say I, that to him or he doesn't, he no, probably think, won't respect No, me. he actually he, would respect He commented me. on my Instagram yesterday. What'd he comment? He said, geez, my guy taking over Instagram today or something like that. I was in the office just not hyped as hell. <laughs> but you comment on mine, I get excited too. Well, look, it's, it's okay. You get more excited about Drake. It's cool. It's, it's Drake. But, it, but I will tell you, I remember you and I had a meeting and we were talking about stuff and I said, is there anybody you want me to bring in? And you said, man, if, if you could get Drake to be a part of this organization and I call future... Uh, right there for what it's worth no this is Literally not an exaggeration minutes, like, we're no. like oh yeah maybe in a few months they'll get an email from drake he calls him 
two minutes in. No, Scooter literally said, I have the perfect guy that would be really, really excited about this. First of all, my man pulled up in like two black cars, hops out, it's raining, he comes in, we do the pitch, he's really excited, says, I got someone who'd be really excited about this. We're like, oh yeah, who's that? He said, Drake. I'm like, yeah, get to fucking... <laughs> like, I hadn't had much interaction with you. So I'm like, man, a lot of people say things and maybe this is like a Hollywood thing. I, I really didn't know you. So I'm like, all right, whatever. Calls yeah. him up. And his future, Drake's manager, came the next day. Or was the Literally next-, next day at 10 a.m., like 12 hours or 16 hours later. Couldn't believe it. And then we invested, and Scooter now we're on effect. Yeah, run it. 100 Thieves. You know what? And then, and then Toronto won, and now you guys are winning. I mean, it's, it's a good thing. I would like to put it on record. Okay. Now, Drake was not wearing 100 Thieves apparel in the photo that we took. But there was 100 Thieves behind him, and I had a 100 Thieves hoodie on. And the Call of Duty team won a championship a month before the Raptors won the finals. So all I'm saying is there's a really good chance that our Call of Duty team broke the curse. <laughs> That's a stretch. <laughs> uh-huh. That's a stretch. Mm-hmm. No comment. No comment. All right. I'm just, I just had to throw it out there. Scooter, I know that you are probably one of the busiest people that is walking and living on this earth. So I appreciate you taking the time to come on the podcast. I'm sure you're going to go to Baltera after. I shouldn't have said that. What? No, I'm actually going. I'm gonna go. Uh, what time is it right now? Four. Great. So I'm gonna go. I got two more calls I gotta make, and then I'm gonna put my kids to sleep. Scooter, can I'm gonna stop being in? No, there. no. Ask me whatever you want. No. I'm here. I got time. Got it. I no. want to hear what the next question was. Oh about. no, I was just gonna say, hey, can I come over and hang out? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? The answer is absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> this is why we're not best friends. No, no, no. You can come over and hang out. Just you can't just show up unannounced. Um, I gotta prepare. Saturday morning, eight a.m. Yeah. <laughs> I'm here Scooter. for part two. <laughs> okay. Listen. Before we before we wrap up, for what it's worth, Scooter Braun, one, where can the people find you? And two, is there anything else you would like to shout out? direct people to what what's on your mind um i I don't want anyone to go find me (laughs) (laughs) you aren't even found my socials i think you know and you can just explain at scooter braun yeah it's pretty much it not that hard b-r-a-u-n i don't yeah yeah, this isn't like a but but here's what i'll say if if i could have like one call to action thing here's what i'll say is is this it we're done after this you you want any more questions uh, no, because all my questions would sound stupid. I just have stupid questions in my head. We asked all the serious I kind of now want to know what they are. How about let's just do a rapid people. round of stupid questions by Nate Shot. Wait, okay. Rapid round. I got to say the answer as fast as I can, Wait, not long we stories. Have anything on here for that? You can't ask how much money he makes because you already asked that. Okay, what's the wildest Hollywood experience you've ever had? I love him to death, but I did manage Kanye West for three years. So I've like, Kanye's the greatest, but I've had some wild experiences just on a daily What's the dumbest thing you've done in the last five years? The dumbest thing I've done in the last five years is, um, rapid fire. I know rapid fire. This because I, I do a lot of dumb stuff, so I'm just trying to think what's the dumbest yeah, well, which thing. Which one I, took the cake? Uh, which one took the cake? Um, I can come back to it. I still got more stupid. Oh, I, I mean, this is not st- yeah, just to top of my head because it's rapid fire. I like left my wife and kids somewhere and said, okay, I'm going to take off. I'll be back. And I had the keys in my pocket and like stranded my own family. Wow. Yeah, it was st- pretty stupid. Yeah. But was that one of those times where you had to make up before you went to bed that night? <laughs> Continue. Uh, oh, what? Not even like, uh, okay, feel free to say no comment. Who's your favorite artist or musician of all time that you didn't ever work with at all? Michael Jackson. Yeah, but it, you, there's drama around that. But yeah, growing up, I was a big Michael Jackson fan, and and uh, but I did get Justin and Ariana both uh, and and Tori all got to work with Stevie Wonder, and that was really cool for me just to be present for that because yeah. I'm a massive Stevie Wonder fan. That's awesome. What is one purchase that you've made in your life that you absolutely regretted? One purchase that I made in my life that I absolutely regretted was um, I invested in this esports team once. Um, so now I'm just playing. Uh, <laughs> Must have been some other team that I don't know. About. Uh, a purchase that I made in my life that I completely regretted. Um, I uh, oh yeah, when I was in um, college, my buddy bet me that I can't eat a hundred chicken nuggets from McDonald's, and we bought. I purchased a hundred chicken nuggets from McDonald's and ate all of them, and was sick for like twenty four hours. <laughs> So That's that the purchase like, you regret the most? Deal. Yeah, because what? I was I so sick. I do that every weekend when I'm hungover. <laughs> what's, <laughs> what's the last time you spent money on something just for you that like, you wanted or thought was dope? Um, 
I'm, I'm just not like, I don't really, I don't buy things that like depreciate like for the most part. So I'm not a big car guy or anything else. Like I'm, I, I don't like money doesn't really like, it's not like a thing. I've never been that way. Okay. Fair so like I, so you know he's rich. Yeah. No, 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 no. But I'm saying even when I was broke, it never was like, I, well, I need to have why something. you're rich. Um, but it's, uh, yeah. So it, like th- those kind of things, it doesn't really, it's, uh, I guess what I spent on myself, um, one of my mentors insisted that I buy a car. And I needed a sports car, so I bought a Porsche 911. Oh, is it a GT3 yeah. RS? Not, keep going. Keep going. Great answer. Do you got anything else? I mean, I could I could do this all day. Okay, come on. Stupid questions. What was the last Asia? video game you played, if any? The last video game I played, if any, was um, NBA 2K. Strong answer. How often do you ride on a private jet? Um, I fly both commercial and private. Strong answer. Are you ever going to go into politics? Because that's all the answers I'm getting. Very political answers. Um, as of right now, I have no interest in putting my family through that. So no, continue. Okay, I think you should be the governor. Okay, <laughs> who's going to win the NBA finals this year? Or I would like it to be the Clippers because then I could watch the whole thing. Mm, okay. Who's going to win the NBA finals this year? I would like it to be the Clippers because I can watch the whole thing. <laughs> How do you feel about Lonzo Ball? Uh, I know you think he's like the greatest and he's going to be a future NBA All Star, and I think he has a lot to prove. Okay. So diplomatic. I just, here's my thing, right? I don't talk shit about people I don't know. I have enough people doing that to me on the internet. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm just like, you don't know what someone else has done. You don't know their morality. You don't, you don't know somebody. So I don't talk shit about people I don't know. What is your favorite experience that you've had in the last, I can't ask you that. You're going to say the birth of your kids or something. I got to ask you something, something else. That was my best experience in the last couple of years. Yeah, definitely yeah. the birth of my kids. How are we going to find Matthew Haig and maybe me, but more importantly, Matthew Haig, a wife? What should he be looking yeah, for? Yeah, honestly, I think here's the thing, Scooter. Now, we've been thinking about this a lot at the office. I already know what I'm going to tell you. All right, but he, no, but you have to understand 100 Thieves, like realistically, for the next like short term future is your life. The more successful I am and the more my status is higher, yeah. the more, you know, more sponsors we're going to get. How do you find me a girlfriend? Um, do you think that you, to get the right girlfriend, you need to be more successful before no. you meet her? No, I was, I, this, we're just bullshit. No, I, okay, so here's what I'd you're, say. You're getting too no, real with no, no, it. You, no, here's what I'll say. You want to meet the right girl, you got to go to a place where the right girl hangs out. How do we... That I can't basically. get into any of those places, Scooter. No, my point is, yes, you can. The, girl, the right girl's probably at a library or hanging out like at a dinner somewhere where like a, a right girl's not hanging out like all night long in the club. Do you mind us asking where you met your wife? I, I saw my wife's TED Talk. And I was really? blown away by it. And I said, I need to meet that girl. But you had the cloud to get to meet her too. She actually had no interest in meeting me because I worked in entertainment. She didn't want to meet anyone in entertainment when she moved to LA. And I tricked her into going to drinks where she thought there were going to be a bunch of people. And I was the only one there. What type of bed do you sleep in at night? A very soft one. Is it organic? Firm yet soft. <laughs> Is it organic? I don't know if it's organic. All right, here's what I learned from my ex-girlfriend is that beds that they make nowadays, they all have flame retardant chemicals and all formaldehydes. We don't know how our body's absorbing that. And so by me having an organic bed that's made by the Amish, literally made by the Amish, my body is not absorbing any of those chemicals that you guys are sleeping on every single night. So I'm adding years to my life, maybe. So the chemicals used to dye your shirt and your pants and your underwear that you're wearing right now, how are those affecting you the majority of your day that you have on? They're giving me powers. <laughs> at this point. Have you, no, they, they absolutely haven't. Have you ever watched anime? Uh, different anime, yeah, growing up. In fact, you know what? It's funny. Bieber is like completely separate anime. And Bieber loves, he's been like hitting me about Pokemon for like the last two days, like nonstop. Pokemon? Like loves Pokemon. He's like, yo, who owns Pokemon? How do I get the old school cards? Like... Bieber's all about Pokemon. He's just like on eBay right now on his iPhone he's just buying me, cards. Yeah, he's been sending me stuff from eBay. He like loves Pokemon. That's Matt, awesome. Matt's favorite thing is to recommend anime to people. Like we had Carl Anthony Towns on one of the podcasts. Well, Carl Anthony Towns oh, actually likes anime. Yeah, I mean, listen. Uh, no, I don't. I can't think of anything. Any more stupid questions. Uh, you got to finish it. What's the last stupid question? <sighs> all right, can I ask you guys one? Yeah. Sure. Hell yeah. I love stu- stupid ready? questions. Okay, are my favorite on. questions. You ready? Uh, fresh socks or fresh sheets? Fresh socks. Forrest Gump. Sheets. Greatest dancer of all time, greatest singer of all time. Greatest singer of all time. Elton Freddie John. Mercury. No. Do you wish you were the greatest singer oh, of all time oh. or are you the greatest dancer of all time? Greatest singer. Singer. Interesting. 
I met one guy who said dancer and I said, are you serious? And he was like, imagine being able to walk into any room and pop and lock on a different level. Yeah. And, but, and then <laughs> imagine popping and locking in a room where people aren't dancing and how weird that is. <laughs> <laughs> what, what also is, walking in and just singing. <laughs> I thought you were asking who the best one is. Yeah. But I was the greatest singer of all time. In your I would, Ellen John, uh, Freddie Mercury. Well, it, it, I, I think it's re- I think it's perspective Maybe because if we're talking about like pure ability, my answer is different. But I really love Elton John. Are you think Elton John's the greatest singer songwriter of all time? Well, somebody else wrote his songs, right? So he wrote right. the music; they wrote the lyrics. Okay, yeah, I love Elton John. I also really love James Taylor. Uh, yeah. Greatest gamer of all time? I can't say me. I'm not. Uh, well, I think it's isn't it? It's Faker, right? In one game, yeah. In one game. Know. Yeah, greatest gamer, it's tough. You know what? For the lot of shit he gets, I, I think Ninja actually has to be in that category. He's really good. Because he was a really good player in Halo, and then every Battle Royale game that came out, he like won a tournament in. So it, Ninja's actually really good for as much of like, once you get too big, people start to talk shit just because... I think he's been a cool like icon of this space. Too. Yeah. There's, there's a few. I but if, if few I were to play uh, Ninja 1v1 in Call of Duty, he's getting smoked. <laughs> What? All right, give me one more stupid question. I like stupid questions. Um, dog or cat? Dog. dog. Okay, that's too easy. I got to give you another one. It's not even a stupid question. I know. I got. You can't even be stupid if you wanted to, huh? <laughs> um, this is tough. We're like making a BuzzFeed video right now. Okay, here. Um, you're having too much fun with this. That's yeah, why you really enjoy. My favorite thing. Um, you're gonna make guests do it from now on. Yeah, I think we should, <laughs> yeah, we got the pre. We yeah, we talk about like success and all the great things that you've done with your business. Let's ask you some stupid stuff. Um, Keep- well, if you guys have one off the top of your head while I'm thinking, you can ask me one. Um, Will you please come to my birthday party? <laughs> Would you rather I'll, I'll have leg size fingers or finger size legs? That one's stupid. That's like not even stupid. That's like mind numbing. That's it's leg amazing. sized fingers or finger sized legs. <laughs> By the way, can I can I can I tell you the greatest thing that everyone, anyone ever told me in college? Like yeah. mind numbing, and then we can leave it at that. And then Let's it's been it. a really fun time hanging out with you guys. My buddy in college goes, "So the universe is infinite," and I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, "So where does it stop?" And I said, "What do you mean?" He goes, "If you imagine right now in your head a planet that has walking Coke cans." that have arms and legs and dancing and singing, where does the universe stop so that doesn't exist somewhere? I could think of a lot better examples than that, but that's a good one. But it's kind of like when you think about it, it kind of messes your head a little bit. Do you believe in the multiverse? Uh, only in Spider-Man, the multiverse, because my kid loves that movie. It's a good movie. Scooter, do you think... Okay, so we did this on the Courage and HR show. You, yeah, I, I, might, I might believe it. I got to look at the physics and all that stuff in it because now I got to sound smart as we talk about it. <laughs> you need to come <laughs> back on the Courage and HR show and Jackson can come on as a guest because he'd be great for this. Jack would be I want to spend an hour um, just reading through conspiracy theories and just talking about it. I'm happy to do that. Do you think aliens are real? I mean, with the, as big as the universe is, they, pretty, they better Coke be. people probably out They there. better be. There's no way we're the only things in the universe. Do you cover up your MacBook camera when you're opening your MacBook and not using the webcam? Uh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Okay. Are you going to raid Area 51 with and get your alien? <laughs> <laughs> we should probably <laughs> stop. Um, where I thought we we're we we're going to do a a big merch drop there for Hundred Thieves. That would. That would be problematic. That would bring even more people. That's very prideful. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, it's called apparel. It's going to be you. sick at our new facility that scooter helped us yeah thanks build. thanks for getting okay all jokes aside i'll end it with this and then we can all hug each other this has actually been a lot of fun um i am very very proud to be a co-owner in 100 thieves i'm really gra- proud to be a part of this organization i think it's infant early chapter one stage of what's going on in esports and, and gaming as a whole and i think that the strategy that this team and this organization has come up with to grow with it long term and be really thoughtful about it and the leadership that you've put around you um is really incredible and and actually a testament to you is how well you've surrounded yourself with experts in their space and given your trust to them and allowed them and and you don't act like a dictator at all you don't act like a pompous dude at all you really trust people to do really great stuff and you've attracted amazing talent like the guy next to you uh to come join this organization because of how you are so bravo to you and uh never feel stupid because you're one of the smartest guys i know and how you're handling things that's like cloud nine. I think we should just end it. Ladies, did you hear what he just said? <laughs> <laughs> I really, no, I genuinely, you, I genuinely appreciate it. Scooter Ron. <laughs> wow, you just made my day. My Thursday just got a whole lot better.
We're yeah. ending the podcast. Rocket Mortgage, thank you for being an incredible sponsor of the Self Made Podcast and all the things we do with 100 Thieves. We appreciate you more than you know. I uh, can't wait to continue to work together for a very, very long time. I uh, appreciate all of you guys watching. Make sure if you are watching on iTunes, leave a five-star review, like the video on YouTube, follow the channel. Tweet subscribe. courage about how much Scooter likes Matt more than him. Yeah. Wait. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's all we have for you guys. Cool. Big thank you to Scooter Braun. This is one of the busiest people on the planet, the fact that he did this. So go show him some love on social media. And uh, please, 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 please subscribe and watch all of our videos forever so that Scooter doesn't get mad at me if 100 Thieves like somehow fails or something. I don't know. That's like we my... We failing. Yeah, we can't fail. We're won't the ships. Can't stop, won't stop. Clear eyes, full heart, can't Keep lose. Work. YouTube, we'll see you later. Goodbye.